old school trash. Is that the best fucking genre in the world or what? Trees! There's a tree right there, how convenient! And attacks you until you die! I can't drop! Bear! Stop! Real! Boy, with the scar from me tearing you in! There's a way you can't escape this fate! What's gonna do? Can you break up? Latching on to its pain! Falling! Can you break yourself down? You can then dance! You violent! Drop! Bits are real! Make your mind with the power! Make it tight until you die! Because it's rolling gardens! Jumping in because it's violent! Fangs! Like sharp and stone! To inflict! From your bones Hello, I just thought I'd join you in a beverage, is that alright cats? Raise your beers! Here's to ten fucking years! Get a dog up your cunts! One more sip, cause you guys are fucking awesome. One more, one more. One, two, one, two, three, four! Steve Mitchell back for another big episode and uh, as always back with my great mate Skull over in DC. How you doing mate? Greetings ladies and gentlemen in Cyberland. As you know this is Skull broadcasting from the past, present and the future in the chamber of the cosmos. Here with my good friend Steve Oz from Ozland. I'm an off again on again DC bomb rock band Black Manta. I've been in the scene for 35 years. Know people from all over the scene and also wanted to add that I worked at the Smithsonian for 20 years and have incorporated my love and passion for history with my love and passion for music. So always uh, really excited to be here and um, very happy to have a special guest here with us today. Dave Ellison, a former bass player for Megadeth. How you doing? Hey, I am doing well, you guys. How are you? Hey, uh, first off, I wanted to say happy 4th of July. America's independence from those evil British guys. <laughs> As I'm sitting in Germany. Uh, <laughs> well, well, yeah, we, we, they, we wanted to catch up with They you. said uh, back to uh, have a great day of work, England, right? Meaning, you know, for us, it's a day off, right? So, uh, but I'm like, yeah, you know, there's no days off in rock and roll. So um, that's why you can be sitting anywhere in the world. And as you are in America, happy fork, by the way. Thanks for representing. And, um, <laughs> 
And uh, so between the three of us, we've divided the world in thirds, I think, right? Between the USA, Europe, and Australia, right? And of course, you'll, oh, yeah, man. You, you'll be out in Australia pretty soon, but um, uh, with Kings of Thrash, but uh, what are you doing in, in Europe at the moment? <laughs> You know, I was over here. My group, Dieth, is here. Uh, we have a festival coming up this weekend in uh, near Prague. And then um, I will be jumping on the big jet to fly down to see you guys in Australia uh, over the weekend. So, yeah, so that's uh, we, we launched the band. Our record came out in June, June 2nd. And we were over here doing some uh, headlining shows, some shows with Testaments. We did an acoustic show. We played grass pop. So we got a bunch of festivals and stuff now carrying on after uh, after Australia. I'll be coming back uh, to some shows in Portugal and France and uh, some shows and stuff in Peru, stuff like that. So, yeah, just kind of going around the planet or something. I don't know. Yeah, you, you, little, you seem uh, to be like a, a busy guy. You have a lot of projects going on right now. Do you want to talk about those a little bit? Sure. Well, look, they all start as projects until they become something more. You know, that's how I look at these things. Um, you know, nothing ever starts as just, hey, let's just do one and see where it goes. Um, or let's just do one. I think we, we you do the first one, you see how it goes. You see if it gets traction. People are responding to it because... You know, part of it is making music. The other part of it is uh, the business of entertainment, right? And, you know, you can make great records. Uh, the Internet has been helpful with this in some way that you can make albums. Guys like us can jump online here to talk about it, discuss it, promote it. Um, but as far as getting it on stage, and taking it around the world, I mean, that's a whole other endeavor. And, you know, even big groups are now you know, commenting and weighing in about the expense of touring. Um, so, you know, I feel very fortunate that uh, Hardline Media has brought, is, is bringing Kings of Thrash down to Australia. So a favorite place for all of us to tour, by the way. Um, you know, the, the, the Aussies are, uh, are, are great people and super awesome rock and roll fans. So that's super thrilled about that. And then, uh, you know, coming over here to, to Europe, you know, to tour Dieth, I mean, you know, look, we're, we're, we're in a van driving around going old school, man, you know, so um, because that's just the reality of what it is. And, you know, for me, I still like to play, man. I like to get on stage and, and play, whether it's to, you know, tens of thousands or only tens. Uh, you know, it's uh, to me, it's, it, it's a fun experience, man. And, and, uh, you know, to me, it's it's an honor when people call and want you to take their stage and play, and and that's the moment you you're in the music business. You know, you're in the entertainment business. You step on stage to perform. So, um, to me, that's kind of the summarization of how I view all this stuff. Is it, I was just gonna say, Go is, do you have a, what is a main band now, or is it is it more of a case of when, when opportunities come up, you sort of have to slot them in uh, around other commitments? Yes. <laughs> yes to that answer. <laughs> because, you know, both apply. I mean, look, um, you know, even when I was in Megadeth, you know, the phone would ring for things and I would go, you know, I, I would go if, if I could make the time and make sense to do it, I, I would go do it. Um, you know, probably the first 20 years of the group, I did not do that. You know, we were very singular focused, you know, we're building a band, building a brand. So I think there's a time in your in your career that you know you really have solidarity. Um, but then you know, as a result of doing that work and and having success from that, that's what allows the phone to ring and people say, "Hey, come over and be a part of this. You want to play on this? You want to join on that?" So um, I say yes to those things. You know, especially now at this point, um, I think um, you know I've I've earned a bit of the you know the ability to do that on one level. Um, so when people call, um, you know, they're calling to hopefully hear me say yes. You know, they're not calling to have me turn them down, you know? So I think, um, again, given the right circumstance, the right thing, you know, my answer was just a yes. And it, was it, was it Guillermo you... that, that reached out to you with, with Dieth or how, how did you um, get together with those guys? It was. Yep. Well, he, we, we were introduced, Martin from Destruction, actually, I guess it's suggested to Glare May, uh, 
you know, to ring me up that I might be interested in, in playing on some, some new tracks because he and Michal uh, were, you know, gathering thoughts and some, some musical ideas about a possibility of a, of a, of a next group for them, you know, post in tune, both uh, decapitated uh, for them. And it was early uh, January 2022, so last year. And um, it was good timing for me because, you know, New Year, you know, kind of new, you know, optimism, as I think we feel sometimes in January. It's like, okay, what's what's in store, you know? And um, I don't take life a year at a glance. I mean, sometimes you do when you're booking tours and scheduling, and you have to kind of look that far out, you know? I kind of try to just live a day at a time. And um, as you never know, like suddenly, you know, again, Steve, you reached out, you know, through the introduction of Doug and next thing you know, now here's on Tuesday, we're doing an interview, you know, um, I think we're all on Tuesday. That's the magic yes. of this, this interview is we've managed to put it all within a, a, a one day. Squeezed it all in. Uh, squeezed it in. Yeah. You know, so and, and I'd say, you know, look, for, for now, Dieth is certainly, um, you know, a main group for sure um you know napalm uh it was a cool deal um and really you know you know the days of the multiple album deals are hard to come by you know because there's a lot of these things where people the labels will license them uh they'll kind of do them an album at a time that way no one's really over committed to anything so you know the fact that we have a multiple album deal I'm lucky that I have uh, outlived all of my multiple album deals, including Combat and Capitol Records and Sanctuary and all the stuff that uh, the deals that I've signed. You know, I was thinking about it a couple of, last month. I think this is my 22nd record deal that I've had, 22 record deals in my lifetime. Um, wow. So, uh, yeah, right. So, it, and and some of that was some distribution stuff, even through my own label. But I put out my own records through my own record labels too. So, um, you know, I'm very blessed that uh, the phone rings, you know, and that uh, people still want to put music out and see me play. And, um, you know, so for me, I think just always the continuum of just keeping it moving, and you know, just always forward motion is is really important i think i think that's for me that's that's the highlight you know the, the numbers and the amount sold is it going to get a grammy or an oscar i mean those are all nice cherry on top of stuff but you know to me it's it's there's something about when you write a song and you're in the room with your buddies and you're making the music together the fact that that gets released and gets put out so that other people can hear it to me is is always the greatest reward well, I was wondering about um, as far as live goes. You think you might be able to? You, will you be bringing it over to the states anytime soon? You know, yeah, for sure. Um, the you know, K uh, Kings of Thrash. We've already done a couple of tours. We launched it uh, last year in October. We actually put it, bundled it together on the Best of the West live at the Whiskey Go Go uh, um, mm -hmm. DVD and double CD package, double vinyl. That just came out in Cleopatra Records, um, so that's out there now. And then we did a tour in February and March, um, kind of a Midwest, East Coast, uh, U.S. run. And uh, so that's why we we're thrilled when the phone rang for us to go to Australia, because um, you know to start having things be international. That you know, as when we were growing up, it's I always tell bands, you know, you're not a hero at home until you're a hero somewhere else. You know, and um, so this month we're going to be a hero down in Australia, you know, so, um, you know, doing something pretty unique, I think, uh, with these records, um, with killing is my business and so far so good sweat. So as it speaks to diet, then, um, you know, we knew because the band is long, is based over here in Gdansk, Poland, uh, we knew that, um, we would spend the summer here, uh, launching the group, doing sort of the first presentations, and um, the good news is, is once we started performing, the phone started ringing. You know, and so more people now want us to uh, tour with them and do all that kind of stuff. Again, coming to America, easy for me because I live there. But, you know, there's logistics of two foreigners um, with uh, Blair May and Mihal uh, coming over, visas and all these kind of things. So 
Um, you know, there's some logistics that you got to jump through, some hoops, with, uh, that kind of stuff. So um, I think one of the things we're doing with diet, though, is that we don't want to just go out and play every, you know, gas station, roadhouse that has an outlet, you know, for a band. Uh, I think now at this point we want to do – I want to do the right shows that have the right look, the right feel to them. Because um, I've, you know, certainly done my time in the trenches over the years. So have Laramie and Mihal in the death metal world. You know, those guys have definitely done their done their hard work. You know, so um, we like to say, as much as we're a new band, we're definitely not a baby band. Well, there's the, the Maryland Death Fest we have here every year in Baltimore. And that's a big deal. I mean, maybe you guys could come to that. Um, I know that they already had the lineup. They already had the lineup for next year, but maybe you guys could come right. one, one of these days. Yeah, no, no. Ex yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Those kind of things are a perfect, you know, opportunity for something like diet, you know, to, to be part of a bigger event. You know, so that's what's cool over here with these festivals. In Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, they're pretty legendary. Um, now we have a lot of course over in America, like you said, the, you know, New England Hardcore, the Festival, the Milwaukee Metal Fest, you're mm -hmm. there in Baltimore. So there's there's a lot of these around now. Um, and now we're post-COVID, things are moving on. And, um, and uh, so, yeah, it's and, – and, you know, the thing is we've already got a lot of material written for a second record. So, you know, and it's funny, the Beatles used to put out records every six months. Kiss used to put out records every nine months. <laughs> You know, so I, I feel like, you know, the world doesn't have to always wait 18 to 24 months to get a new album, at least in my mind. You know? um, I, I like the idea, of, since the band's prolific and we, we write well together, just keep that moving, man. Put more content out. You know, I've seen the Hollywood Vampires a couple times this last month. And, was, and then I went on, you know, iTunes and started checking their stuff. I was like, man, these guys have a lot of tunes, you know, so... Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's uh, groups uh, that aren't just grinding it on the road uh, every freaking day. You know, we have the opportunity to, to do a little more um, writing, I think, and, and maybe you know, put, put more material out for the fans for it. And given, given you guys well, are, I... are, are dispersed in terms of your, your locations, uh, how do you find it collaborating remotely? Yeah, I mean, that's always the thing, right? I mean, you know, when Diet first formed, you know, was, we had to do it virtually, of course. I, I recorded um, my tracks in Phoenix, uh, sent them back, and, you know, because we're, we're pros and we've done this a lot, so, you know, we can put things together. But, you know, then I came over here to Europe um, a couple months later, and I said, listen, I'm here, let's get in a room, let's shoot this music video for this song. You know, we're, we're tired of seeing it four square iPhone photos from COVID now. Let's move past that. And so Galerme put together a really kick-ass video shoot up in Gdansk at a very cool club there. Uh, we shot in the Hall of the Hanging Serpents video. We put that out um, uh, a couple months later. And that's what really responded. I mean, it's, it's got huge views immediately. That's what got our deal with Napalm. You know, that became our, our demo, basically, you know, and that became our sort of audition you know in the old days you'd have to like get on stage and audition at a troubadour or whiskey or whatever local venue you're in your town you know and mm -hmm. um you know now it's so much of the stuff is is you know based on you know youtube and internet numbers and all this kind of stuff which you know i quite honestly aren't even really factual i mean <clears throat> you know there's there's groups who have huge social media numbers who can't put 50 people in a concert venue and then there's other people who, you know, are probably because of their of, of uh, age and the stature, social media hasn't been such a big thing for them, but they still sell records and they can pack the fans in the, in the building, you know. So to me, social media and these things, a younger industry, a younger generation trends for these things. I think it's I call bullshit on most of it, you know. Um, I saw it even when I had my band F5 years ago and we were on MySpace. And, oh, so, a hundred people said they're going to the show in Scottsdale, you know, and, and it for sure wasn't that, you know what I mean? It's, you could tell who showed up and actually bought a hard ticket at the box office because they were friends or, you know, fans of ours versus, you know, 
what the internet says, you know. So um, I just take most of those numbers and just kind of throw them in the trash. <laughs> when people say, you know, are you going to this event? You know, interested? Maybe you know, it's like whatever. You know, I, I think that that's that that's a very deceptive and not a very realistic, you know, view of what the reality of, of our business is. And obviously, because if you're in the metal, Dave Ellison is a name that is instantly recognisable. Maybe not Kings of Thrash or Dieth. Like, how, how have you tried to, uh, I guess, reach out those fans who are familiar with your work that they're now familiar with those new names? Well, I think with Kings of Thrash, we just stated the obvious. You know, we we didn't know to the degree of Kings of Thrash. We we kind of repped it pretty broad so that we can have a little bit of maneuverability with it. Um, and of course, we. Preach to the choir right out of the gate playing these, these mega death records that Jeff and I have been a part of. Um, and, um, but we put our names on the door right away, you know, King of Thrash featuring David Allison and Jeff Young. You know, we just wanted to state the obvious, because you're right. I mean, ultimately, what is King of Thrash? What is Diet? You know, so they're, they're, they're new bands, they're new brands. And, um, you know, it's 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 about that. And and you know, at the same time I try to kind of be a little careful with where I put my name, you know, because it, because of the instant recognizability of my name, it's like, okay, well what is this? You know, and I a manager told me that many years ago. He said he goes, this, because there's gonna be a time for David Ellison to go solo and be David Ellison. But you just gotta know that that's really the time and you're really ready for that. And, and maybe that's the next thing coming down the pike at some point. It's me, especially now that I'm singing with Diet and I'm doing some of these things, I'm branching out. I always like to do them. You know, I, I grew up wanting to be in a band. You know, I never grew up wanting to be a solo artist. You know, that was never the end game for me. You know, well, I'll do this band thing for a while until I can finally go solo. You know, that was that's never been my deal. You know? To me, bands are brotherhoods. Um, you're, you're you're a vibe of a tribe, and um, you know that's 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 how we do this. You know, so um, it's always more fun to do it with your friends. You know, um, so that's that's why to me, I always put it under a band name, and you know, and then very blatantly you obviously put my name around it with the advertising and stuff like that. Yeah, that's that's how I've done it so far. You wouldn't read about it. I thought the company would just be tall. I got back, I look for a minute, I got a gun. I got the bullet! Listen, 
very carefully. I might save a life. Don't listen to me. I might save a life. Are you listening to me? Right here, we have two types of people. One's a leader, the other's a follower. Which one are you? It doesn't matter. You just gotta work it out, fellow young. Maybe one day, maybe one day. And that girl you left behind. The girl about her! The girl about her! Only one way to be one thing only. Remember this. Alone is the only way to be! Oh, 
I wanted to go kind of go back to the beginning because you have a very unique perspective because you started off, you were a young kid, you started off pretty young. So um, how did you, how did you get started? I mean, you had, you know, that spark early and you, you, uh, you got <laughs> basically got picked up re relatively early. So how did, how did that whole thing happen? You know, it's a good question. And, and, you know, look, I grew up uh, literally on a court on a farm six miles north of a little town of about 3,000 people, Jackson, Minnesota, right? Wow. And, you know, what are the chances? You know, I was formally trained a bit on piano and pick up tenor sax and orchestra from band, but that, that wasn't my thing. I, I wasn't, you know, destined to become Liberace or, you know, be, um, you know, Wayne Shorter or some, you know, tremendous saxophone player. Um, you know, one day, you know, after hearing rock and roll, guests in particular and sticks and sweets and those kind of fans, you know, the bass guitar just called to me, you know, and, I, and I'm convinced that your instrument chooses you. You don't choose your instrument. And, um, you know, the bass was like a divine moment, you know, because uh, like, why the hell would anybody in a freaking that area of the country play the bass, right? I mean, most people be like, play guitar, be the drummer, be the singer, like be the famous one, right? Um, and, you know, the bass is a bit more of an understated instrument in a lot of settings. For me, I saw the bass as being a more upfront, you know, I always wanted to be right up front with the, with the, with the front line of the band, right? With the guitars and the singer. I mean, that's where I envisioned me seeing. I was never a stand in the back and just hold it down with the drummer kind of guy. Um, so, you know, when I saw Iron Maiden with Steve Harris, when I saw Getty Lee with Rush, when I saw, you know, these type, types of um, bass players, you know, Chris Squire from Yes and these things, uh, that those guys were my heroes because they were bold enough to step up front, often sing, Phil and Otten did Lizzie, of course. Um, you know, these guys, you know, for me, kind of paved the way, to be honest with you. And and I tell you, the one record that really was the sort of affirmation for me is when that first Def Leppard record, On Through the Night, came out. I think I was 15 years old. My band was, you know, we were up and running. We were out gigging. We were playing. Because um, I started playing bass around 11 or 12 years old. So a few years later, I, I you know, every day I, I had a band always. And we'd gig, we'd play. Now we're starting to do the bars and the clubs and, in the Midwest, you play ballrooms, right? These these old ballrooms that were built with string bands back in the 30s and 40s and stuff. And uh, so we were starting to do those gigging at those at these these venues, um, mostly weekends. Obviously, still in high school. Um, but uh, that Def Leppard record came out, and um, I remember my, my drummer in our band. He was like, dude, the drummer's only 16, and I think the oldest guy in the band is the singer. I think he's 19, you know, with Joe Elliott. And I just saw those guys. That You know, I, I know Phil a little bit. Um, when I played with Ronnie Montrose, Def Leppard had invited Montrose to, to play with them on a couple of shows in Florida and Alabama. So, um, But I don't, I don't know most of the guys in the band, right? So the other day, I'm on, standing on stage with Rick Allen, and... Um, we're geeking out. We're watching Generation Sex, right? Play uh, at Grass Pop, uh, which is, I mean, it's Billy Idol and the bass player from Generation X with Steve Jones and Paul Cook from the Sex Pistols. So we're sitting there geeking out over, you know, the whole thing just because we're basically kind of a you know, similar age, you know. And uh, um, so, you know, as famous as that band is, at the end of the day, we probably grew up on the same music, right? Same kind of stuff, you know, sweets. When Lizzie was around, these kind of things, you know, they being British. You know, I'm not like a big Beatles fan. The Beatles were not my my band. Kiss was my Beatles, you know. Um, sure, sure. I saw Kiss the other night. Uh, it just, you know, I, I see Kiss, and of course I'm a professional, so I kind of know behind the curtain of Oz how all this stuff works now, you know. But, you know, I think it's good to go see concerts to remember why we play concerts. You know, it's good to be a fan. Mm -hmm. It's good to just be inspired again and, you know, to watch Kiss and go, man, they're still the biggest, the best, the coolest in the world. You know, they, they, they pull out all the punches. They spare no expense. They go the extra mile. They give everything they have to that show and they have for 50 years. And it's like, man, that, that is a life well lived, in my opinion. Sure, sure. So the, so the base of, 
on that first album, the Def Leppard album, was like, was what grabbed you? There was something that spoke to you on that album? Yeah, you know, I think it was more of the band. You know, on the back of the record, they're on stage with ACDC. You can see they're playing either on Highway to Hell or on the back of Black Tour. Um, and, um, you know, it's funny then when Metallica got going, it's funny how Lars, he kind of just went down the back of the Def Leppard record and said, I want that business manager, I want that agent, I want that manager. Because <laughs> he kind of basically has... And God sure, God, that's he was smart. Because yeah. most, most of us wouldn't pick up like, let me see, let me pick up my favorite album, Kiss, all right? I want that manager. You know, they, if you ever called them, they go, who is this? David Ault, the farm in Minnesota? Get out of here, kid, you know? Lars actually pulled it off, so God bless him. Um, but, you know... That record was at a pivotal time, you know, because right, that was right around, the, course, that, that's part of the new wave of British heavy metal, right? So also yeah, yeah, now, yeah. Motorhead, Ace of Spades, and the Hammersmith record are showing up in my house, uh, Black Sabbath, um, Heaven and Hell, Scorpion's Love Drive, um, uh, you know, the uh, first Iron Maiden record, Diamond Head, Venom, you know, so this stuff's starting to come into my life. So, you know, that, that was the, that was a game changer for me. Um, because those were, and before that, probably Judas Priest. Was, was they were kids. Like, feel like you said, they were kids. So yeah. they, they were, they were young, man. And they were, they were, they showed, you know, whereas Kiss was taking you off into a fantasy land of characters and makeup and, you know, these bands, and now I'm a few years older. I'm not 12 years old. I love the kids. Now I'm 15, 16. Really, you know, you know, at least semi-professional, you know, looking toward being a full-time professional, you know, uh, artist, rock star, all that goes with that. So, um, you know, though, that new wave of British heavy metal was an age group that was just a couple years ahead of me. And it, and it, 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 it reaffirmed that, that I could do this. So... I, I, at 16, I made up my mind I was going to move to California. So two years later, at 18, and right after graduated high school, I did it. I made, I moved, you know, me and my three buddies. So, you know, to move there and then intersect with Dave Mustaine, who, you know, now is just out of Metallica, who I had not heard of yet because they were, that summer they were recording Kill, uh, Kill em All album and uh, getting it ready to come out. Um, so to meet Dave and you know, know that this was uh, this was an intersection that that was meant to happen. You know, and you know what's the saying, right? Life can only be lived; for, it can only be understood in reverse, but it has to be lived forward, right? So now I look back over the last forty years of my life, you know, in particular with Megadeth, because I was active, you know, getting my chops together, you know, some years, five, six, seven years before that. But, you know, starting sort of with Megadeth, that was sort of the first big kind of international look for me as a, as a every young player and musician starting a band. Um, and, you know, it all makes sense, you know. Um, even the transitions kind of in and out of the group. Um, but, you know, I guess even those had to happen for, for various reasons. Um, and, and one of them for sure is for me to just kind of grow and, and move on, you know, and, you know, um, people have said to me, they said, you know, if you're still in Megadeth, we wouldn't get to hear you sing Walk With Me Forever with Dio, you know, and, um, you know, so these things are a nice transition forward. And the other thing, too, that I guess I've done maybe you know, like somewhat intentionally, but, but, you know, probably not as sort of thoughtful. Um, was, you know, bringing back my, my former Megadeth cohorts to do stuff together with them, you know, um, and that, and that speaks to Kings of Thrash, you know, which is, you know, Jeff was in the group there for a couple of years. We were supposed to go to Australia in 1988 and the tour got canceled. And so, you know, I think for the two of us to come back and sort of kind of make good on that finally, all these years later and play So Far So Good So What, which is the album that would have been mostly playing in those days in that day um and then the gift of killing is my business because that record is probably never going to be heard again live you know so um you know to go play these songs for the fans you know the fans in australia they probably never heard these things played live and they're probably not going to so it's it's kind of a um 
a duty of honor, you know, to uh, to be able to come down there and, and do this, and, and again bring bring with me a couple of young bucks with Chaz and and Fred, who are fantastic players, and do the songs justice. And whose idea it was to do the the, the full album on, on on the Kings of Thrash shows? Well, it's funny, you know, the idea really came to me in in uh, fall of 2021. I was appearing at the Chiller Theater. Uh, autograph show in uh, New Jersey and it, it's a big show it's hard to get into my agent finally got me in there um, and Megadeth and Lamb of God had just come through the area and it was my first now tour I've been out of the group of minutes. and fans were coming to me and they were complaining they were like you know the band only plays nine or ten songs it's kind of the same songs you've been hearing for years and years like you know what the fuck like, like you know and I said, and as they would then hand me their killing is my business record autograph, right? And um, and when even when I was in the band in 2018, I, I brought it up to the band manager and said, we need to go out and play this record, even if it was one night. Say invite us to New York or you know, not from Chicago, which is one of the venues we actually played in 1985 on that tour. I said, we, we need to do this, man, for the fans. It's you know, I, I watch what Metallica does. I watch what Iron Maiden does. I watch what their you know competitors and peers are doing. They put the time in, man. You know, to 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 do justice to their to their songs. And you know, I kind of feel like you know, Killing is my business. It, 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 there was a lot of history around it that wasn't so positive back in the day. But like, whatever, get over yourself. You know, get out and fucking do what's right for the fans. They're the ones buying the tickets. You know, at some point. You're the puppet, you know, they're the puppet master, right? It's like, they want to hear these songs, if I can go play them, you know? So um, I, I, that was really the day that, that the idea was born. In fact, I came home and I called Chris Paul and I said, dude, you and me need to go out and play. Go to like business at Pete Sells. The side A of Pete Sells gets played quite a bit, but the side B does not. Black Friday, Matt Omen, you know, this stuff. So, um that was where it started. And so it, it was funny that a few months later, Jeff and I would get connected through the Nick Menzel documentary that we're putting together. Um, and then he and I uh, get invited to jump on stage at the Whiskey, the ultimate show at night, we'll do a tribute to the Big Four in May of last year. And that then made it reality, you know. Jeff and I on stage together, playing Mary Jane, playing in my darkest hour, you know, all of a sudden it's like, there it is, you know, um, there's the demo, right? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and the fans loved it. And so I called a manager friend of mine and he, he basically all put it together. And, and, and that's when we agreed. It's like killing. I said, we got to play killing. And, he's, and I said, well, I may as well play so far so good. So what? And, um, and he said, yeah, do them both in the same night. And well, get the frickin', it's a muscular set list, man. I mean, these are not like ballads, you know, these are pretty ferocious, aggressive, very fast material. So, um, you know, it requires us to be on our game, you know? And um, so it's it's really good. Like I said, Fred on drums and Chaz on vocals. Chaz has been a mega tribute band in Orange County. So he, uh, he already knows the drill, you know. He's he's uh, he's got great set of pipes. He's a great guitar player. I mean, he's, he and Jeff really complement each other. So, you know, for me, this is just a moment in time to, you know, pay homage to to our legacy, you know, and um, give the fans a, a nice treat. And uh, um, we have a lot of fun on stage. The songs are fun to play. Um, we haven't played them in many, many decades, to be honest with you. So, you know, to honestly, the the honor is ours <laughs> to be able to get to go do this. It's, it's really, really been cool.
Well, I know that back in the day there was the the feud between Megadeth and Metallica. And when I was a kid, it was like you were either a Metallica kid or you were a Megadeth kid. And, but you know, um, you know, at that time, I mean, what what did you think of Cliff Burton? And eventually, and for the audience out there, can you just go back and give a little history on the the song "In My Darkest Hour," which is a tribute to Cliff? A lot of people might not know sure. that, so if you could talk about cliff uh, at the time and his influence on you and and how the song came about sure well to answer that question first so metal maria maria ferraro who is now uh, a big heavy metal publicity firm she worked for uh, johnny z for megaforce records back then and she called dave early in the morning uh we were living in our band apartment in silver lake um just east of hollywood um we were writing started you know we begin writing what would become the first good sweat and she called dave to say that cliff you know had, had was killed in bus, bus action and so he picked up his guitar and started writing the music uh so the music was inspired you know by the somber tone of god's fall um that's where that that started um and look you know the the Megadeth Metallica feud, look, it was not my feud, right? Because uh, I know, I'm a huge Metallica I know, fan, right? You know, you know, yeah. look, I'm in the band with Dave, so I got to tell the company line, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, it's one of these, hey, man, if you're my friend, you got, you know, you have to, you have to love my friends and you got to hate my enemies with me. You know how that is, right? You know, yep. oh, and, yeah. um, you know, we like that guy, that chick, fuck her, you know, that sucks, you know, you know. So whatever, you know, so we know how this goes, right? So here I am, and, you know, look, I love Metallica. I hear the No Wife to Leather demo, and it's freaking awesome, right? And and I still love that record, and uh, or, or demo, I should say. And then, you know, Kill 'Em All comes out. I mean, remember the day we sat there when it showed up? We sat there in, like, stone-cold silence, you know, for, like, an hour while we listened to the Kill 'Em All album. And, um, you know, God bless the Game Dave, changer. Just, well, yeah, and, you know, for just sort of biting the bullet and just going, okay, I need to listen to this. What do they do to my songs? What do they do to stuff? Obviously, the first thing he sees is the writing credits. And stuff that he had written by himself, like Mechanics, you know, now had the writing credits of James and Lars. And look, look, to their credit, they did rewrite the lyrics. You know, The Four Horsemen is an entirely different lyrical thing. Um, you know, I wasn't in the room as this stuff was going down, but, you know, there's, um, you know, it's kind of like, I always looked at it like, hey, Dave, they gave you the greatest gift ever. You know, not only did they use your song and paid you for them, mm -hmm. they mo just as importantly put your name on it. And that, I mean, what a great, that gave Megan Death such an incredible advantage to starting out, um, you know, it's like me, I guess we were just talking about Diaf and Kings of Thrash. It's like, well, you know, here's the Megadeth record. Yeah, that's definitely me, you know, <laughs> my name, my credits, you know, so, you know, it, these things always help, you know, every, you know, there's a saying in jazz, you're only as good as your last gig, right? So, because every gig you do leads you to the next opportunity, right? Um, so for Dave, you know, having that Megadeth or that Metallica history gave Megadeth a huge advantage to starting, you know, and, and um, you know, I, I, I often wish that he would have been a little more appreciative of how well we did and the gifts we had and how many fans came to his side, you know, despite, you know, the departure and, 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 you know, and, and and I've learned from that myself now that I'm not at Megadeth going, you know, be appreciative. And a lot of people came to my side. You know, you don't have to hate Megadeth to like David Ellis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, please like I came Megadeth. around on I, this I'm album. Like, I was, yeah, I was like, this album's a There you go, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, thank you. And I know fans who came in much later, you know, and that, that picked up more recent Megadeth albums. Because that's just, how, that's their age, right? They're younger, and it's when they started getting into rock and roll and heavy metal. And then they go back like I did with my heroes. I came on Kiss Destroyer, and then I went back and bought all the mm -hmm. Kiss Alive and Three Studio albums. And, um, you know, really became a fan. So you know, I, I've learned don't ever disrespect your past work, you know, even if there's something in there that that uh, you know maybe you weren't as pleased with it. Uh, maybe it didn't sell as well. You know, just because something didn't sell doesn't mean you should ever disrespect it. You know. Um, so, 
sales have so much more to do with whether it's good or not. You know what I mean? Um, look, things have sold a lot that weren't that good. You know, we all know those albums. And that's just because of the popularity of the band. You know, the brand was big. The popularity was huge. Um, that doesn't mean it was their best album, you know? Um, so, um, so the other, yeah. So, you know, back to the whole kind of that whole thing. So, you know, look, I'd listen to Metallica on the radio. I people living in LA, they had Candy C and things. They would always do, you know, mandatory Metallica and all this stuff. But I mean, you know, that, that band broke down so many doors for all of us. And then, you know, when I met the guys, I met James Bars, and I'm like, guys are totally cool. Like, I don't know. It seemed like it'd be pretty fun to be in a band with those guys, you know? So, you know, I always liked them. I, you know, watched them grow and develop and basically take over the world. Was, I got a front row seat to that. And I thought that was really, really awesome, you know? And they've been very what, gracious. What about Cliff? Us. Yeah. And so, Cliff, you know, it's funny. The last time, you know, those guys would always come to our shows and we would play up in the Bay Area. And if they were home off tour, they'd come to our shows. And we did some gigs with them. You know, we played New Year's Eve, 85, 86. Um, they had just come home from recording Master of Puppets. Um, they still had the Ride the Lightning backdrop. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, Anthrax had, had dropped off, so they added Megadeth. So it was Megadeth, Metal Church, Exodus, and Metallica uh, wow. for New Year's Eve show. Um, super, awesome. super great. Um, I remember Exodus were phenomenal that night. Probably the best Exodus show I've ever seen. I was in Bail Office, still in the band. Super, super great hometown game for them. But yeah, so the Metallica guys would come to our gigs. Um, you know, Cliff was, was, a, was a quieter guy, um, but, um, you know, everybody loved him, you know? And um, the last time I spoke with him was uh, when they were with, out with Ozzy, they played in Meadowlands there in New Jersey, across the river from New York. And uh, their A and R guy, Michael Lago from Electro Records, was courting Dave and I to sign Megadeth to uh, to Electro, and um, so he took us over to the gig, uh, to the show that night. It was super awesome. Um, I mean, Master of Puppets is probably my favorite Metallica record, and to see them on that on that tour was great. They were really learning how to become an arena act you know we would go through the same process in a couple of years a year or so later with when alice cooper took us out on the peace cells tour so to watch them and how they were transitioning and and that was was great and after the show you know dave and i went back and hung with them and talked to them and i remember talking to cliff about the songwriting on the new record which you know because he had a orion that he had written and some stuff and he said he goes you know i didn't write as much on this record as they did on ride the lightning um so I just remember in particular having that conversation. And then that was the last night I saw him. I went to Europe after that with Anthrax and then the bus accident happened. So, um, but yeah, Cliff was a very nice guy, kind guy. What, what about his bass style? Would, would you think, would you say that you were influenced by him or you guys influenced each other? Or, I mean, I know he has a, a more of a unique style of playing. Um, yeah. No, not, not, not influenced. You know, I mean, look, he was well on his way by the time I got to LA. Um, you know, he'd already been in the band a year or two, I guess, at that point. Um, and was doing his thing. Um, and I, I got, I, and I was not influenced by him either because I had already done my studies. Mm -hmm. I showed up in California ready to go, you know. Um, whereas Cliff probably had a, maybe a little more of a kind of a classical study. I probably had a little more jazz study mm. with me. Um, and part of the reason I became a, a pretty proficient pick player is not only did I enjoy pick bass players like Gene Simmons and Ian Hill and Cliff Williams and Bill Lanotte and Pete Way and Tom Peterson and these guys. Um, I also love, uh, Anthony Jackson, who played uh, with Al Di Miola, and just as much, I love how Al Di Miola played. I adopted a lot of Al Di Miola's really staccato pick playing over to my bass playing. The really clean staccato, yeah. So Al Di Miola is probably one of my one of my biggest pick style influences uh, on the bass guitar. Wow, and wow. Um, so yeah, so Cliff and I had a very different sound, and I think with Dave, when things he you know, Dave was very driven. He was very focused in a lot of ways. You know, he, he took a lot of 
you know, sort of Lars-isms, if you will, into Megadeth initially, because I think Lars, you know, as much as Dave certainly helped create the Metallica sounds, you know, Lars for sure was an influence on Dave how to run a band, you know, mm-hmm. and sort of the songwriting style and stuff like that. But, um, you know, Dave, I think, saw in me a blank canvas that he could create. He could utilize me to create his songs. And he was always very generous in pulling the bass forward to be part of the um, to be part of the song. You know, he wasn't mm-hmm. like, hey, this is my band. It's my thing. I'm, I'm going to do everything. I'm up front. He was not like that when he was composing at all. You know, and in fact, he wasn't even the singer in the beginning. It, it, he became the singer as New Year's Eve was 83. We held an audition and the singer didn't show up. So Dave stuck the, there's some pictures of it actually where he put the, the lyrics on a mic stand and, and sang, I don't know if it was chosen ones or something like that. And, and um, almost passed out after singing it because he really wasn't a singer and breathing and all this kind of stuff. But, and I was the one that encouraged him. He said, dude, that was fucking awesome. You should be the singer. And, and, you know, he, I don't think he was convinced, but I said, trust me, it, you're the guy, you know, because, because, you know, these, they were, they was writing stories, you know, and it's like, who the hell else is going to tell these stories? I watched him. We'd sit there as he would try to explain, not just, hey, sing this line with this melody, you know, phrasing. He, he really would try to explain the story of what he was, the intention of what he was writing. And, you know, you'd see these guys walk in with their coiffed hair and these scarves and, looking all sunset strip and you go this guy is this guy is not cut from our cloth at all you know what i mean right. and, and you know dave and i we, we rolled the same way man you know we, we understood the lifestyle we listened to the same music you know and and i i was thrilled because i'm like fuck i finally found a guy who really he not only gets this but he knows it and he's lived it you know with metallica he had actually truly lived you know that and Lars being from over here you know being Danish you know he, he brought with him to America a whole different mindset and as did Zoltan from Five Finger Death Punch you know me and Zoltan had some conversations about that you know he broke Five Finger over here the same way Lars broke Metallica you know he knew the markets and the countries that would embrace this music and built it around that they targeted certain countries and you know, Five Fingers a big group now, you know. Um, and, and again, Zoltan, being from Hungary, he viewed this from a different, as living in America, he understood internationally how the music connects around the world. And that's a great advantage to having your band, and that's the advantage I have in Diet, <laughs> is these guys really get what the fuck, you know, how this, how this translates over here in Europe, and that's why we dedicated this band to being a European band, not trying to make it a u.s band out of the gate you know we knew that our, our real connection you know of, of fans was, was going to largely you kind of bloomer your planet if you will so i'm i'm considering myself really fortunate to be with guys who really know that style of music in these countries and in these cultures well, it was, it was, I just want to follow up and say it's really cool to think that, like, I mean, you were there at the ground level, at the ground floor of, like, the birth of heavy metal, the birth of the thrash scene, and you were there to witness, and as a young kid, you were there to witness witness it firsthand, so yeah. that's, you know, obviously a very special thing. Um, I mean, do, do you have a favorite Megadeth album from back then, or... You know, it's funny. You know, it's funny that we're playing Chilling and So Far So Good because those two records were a little bit lost in between the big ones of Peace Cells and Rust in Peace, right? But if you're a real Megadeth fan, when I say real meaning, you know, you don't just hear the hit song on the radio and then move on. Die hard. Like you, you buy the records, yeah, you... Like you, you open up that piece sells album, you read the lyrics, you read the credits, who played what. So yeah, I can tell you're that guy, right? As as yeah, as I am, you know. That's how I buy my records. Too, right? cassette. <laughs> <laughs> Which is harder to read the lyrics, but you can still yeah. do it, right? <laughs> but um, you know, I think you know those records again. People have been clamoring for that stuff. You know, I mean, there's a lot of guys, nine big rock stars that came out in the '90s. Mark Tremonti from Creed being one. 
you know, these guys, because of their age, and when they got a guitar in their hand, you know, the way Kiss Destroyer was the game changer for me. You know, P. Sells was a game changer for Dimebag Daryl, as he would tell me. You know, Mark Tremonti got Mar you know, Master of Puppets and So Far So Good So What, like at the same time or whatever, you know, and, and, and I, 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 I think those are the records for him. And I don't want to put words in his mouth, but, you know, he just told me, he said, he goes, man, So Far So Good So What, that was my record, man. That was the one that really got me into playing guitar. And, you know, then he went on to fucking become his own you know, legend that he is, you know, so... So far, so good. So what was it? Just that age of people that then be, had the, you know had record deals and became rock stars in the nineties. So far, so good. So what was that record for, for a lot of them? Sure, sure. I'm now, and this is this is another question. This we're going off a little bit uh, tangent here, but we haven't really had a chance to talk about Nick Menza. Now he passed away a few years ago, but as mm -hmm. uh, as a drummer, I mean, as a rhythm section. I mean, those, those, those three albums, you know, uh, Rust in Peace and, um, you know, I have them right here all on cassette. I just wanted to yeah. show you. Yeah. I thought you might get a kick out of it. I have I have them all on yeah. cassette. I have Rust in Peace, the Countdown to Extinction on cassette, and I have Euthanasia. I have all three of these on cassette, like bam, 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 nice. one after other. They're, they're, all, they're all masterpieces, uh, amazing heavy metal, thra you know, thrash metal albums, and like as a rhythm section, you and and uh, Nick Menza were just amazing. Yeah, thank you. You know, Nick. Yeah, Nick was a very off the chain kind of drummer. You know, he. It's great. It's funny because in the studio he played really good to a clip. You know, he was a really masterful recording drummer, um, and yet live, his tempos would fluctuate. He'd really push things because he was in the moment, man. He was Keith mm -hmm. Moon. You know, he was. He was really, you know, he was sure. living the moments and um, the adrenaline. But you know, it's funny. He always used to, he always used to say, you know, backstage, you get ready to go on stage, and he would yawn. Be like, it's gonna be a good show tonight, right? And he said, he goes, every time I yawn, it's always a good show. And there was some sort of, you know, physical physicality thing that he would transition to because then once he'd get up on stage and stand up on his kid put his drumsticks in the sign of a cross and, you know, he, he, you know, he was always the first one on stage, then Marty, then me, then Dave, you know, and, um, you know, we learned this stuff, of course, from Kiss, right? How do they come on stage, right? You got to do these things like they do, right? But, you know, sure. Nick, you know, Nick, he was, he was a persona, you know, and it's funny, I was watching, you know, I was at the Guns N' Roses concert last night and I'm looking and I'm going, you know, this was kind of the end of a generation where not only were did, did bands become famous, but their members became legitimate rock stars. And there was a, 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 a connection, like a real, you know, lifestyle connection, you know, um, and then corn of course came later, you know, they, maybe they're one of the last ones to be honest with you, you know, I always say, you know, there's a lot of great bands, but man, if you saw them at the food court in a mall, you'd never know them from the employee, you know. Um, and that kind of became a thing in the 90s, right, where bands were, that's kind of what it was, right? Um, there was a lot of times when bands were just, uh, you know, the, the, their whole thing, they, they often dressed in, the, in a very street kind of attire, right? And, and, um, and the and the audience, they almost wanted an anti rock star, you know. Um, that would and set forth certainly from Seattle. Let's call it just Nirvana for sure, you know. And you know, kind of you know, you know the old you know kill your kill the rock star kind of thing, you know. That became cool to kill your rock stars, um, and and then then you had your anti rock stars. And I'm like, I don't know, who wants to pay for that? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's, you get that anywhere. Um, so, uh, I said, you know, it's, people don't pay for ordinary, they pay for extraordinary, you know, like something, something more than ordinary. You know, if you will. So, um, I, and I, I'm lucky that I got to be part of that movement, you know?
know, Megadeth was a more of jeans and t-shirts kind of band, but, but there was a real connection to the personas in the group. And I think that's what people always loved about the 90s is that was a real, that was a four-piece group, man, you know? I mean, Megadeth is a band, <clears throat> but it's, it, 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 that was a different era, you know, where it, it really, it's, uh, it, it was more than the music, it was more than a song, it's about this real s kind of social and, and, and um, you know, cultural connection to the fans. And I think that's what made that era and that lineup so special. The song's a nice um, crowd punchy chanty one. Um, it's called Bring On The. Uh, all right, a couple of you know it. This will be fun. <laughs>
just before we wrap up, I'd just like to touch on a couple of other projects we haven't talked about. Um, one being your collaboration with Jeff Scott Soto. Um, is that was that a yeah. one-off thing, or is that something that you'd like to do more of? No, you know it's funny I, that. You, so I had the Ellison Band, which started when I was doing Bass Story, which ironically started from my spoken word tour in Australia back in 2015. Uh, promoter brought me down there to do, and I thought spoken word was like, you know, sitting in a coffee shop, drinking, you know, drinking coffee or tea and reading something out of your book. So I brought my bass with me and I just got on stage and I kind of did a clinic slash storyteller thing. And that's what created bass story. Right. So I did bass story all over the world. It was South America, U S tours, I took it across Europe. I uh, started having a backing band with me. And then that's what led to the Ellis and records happening that I did uh, sleeping giants and the cover. And so as I transitioned into 2021, I wanted to make a record. Um, and, uh, my partner, Andy Martin jelly, uh, in, down in Verona, Italy, uh, he and I are the you know, writers of all that stuff, all the songs. And he said, he goes, dude, just call Jeff. He goes, you'll love Jeff. You love him as a, as a buddy. You love his singing. It's like, who, who's going to sing this stuff better than him? I said, you know, and Andy, you're right. And, you know, and, and it's funny because, you know, as much as I'm friends with a lot of people, you know, look, I fanboy too, you know, and I fanboyed on Jeff. I mean, shit, he was in fucking English, man. You know, he sang in Rise of the Horse, you know, that stuff. So, you know, there's a part of me as much as, you know, me and Jeff go hang out and eat tacos. And I see him with trans Siberian Orchestra. There's a part of me like, well, what if he says no, you know? <laughs> like, I, you know so, you know, what if he doesn't want to do it, you know? So, um, I sent a track to him. He sent it back. It's killer. I mean, he did it like an hour. It's freaking awesome. And so mm. I sent him another one and then another one. And then, and that's when it just said, hey, let's just, he said, he goes, look, I don't want to just be like a hired singer with this stuff. I'd, I'd rather, you know, let's see if we do it together. You, me and Andy. So it's great. That's, that's music to my ears. So, you know, again, like we we're talking about earlier, the branding, let's just state the obvious. Ellison Soto. Like, let's not screw around here. Let's just make it what it is. And um, yeah, he and I and Andy, I mean, we, we really get along well and it's it's fun. We, we have another good chunk of songs already written that at some point we'll, you know, probably make its way to an album again. And the other one I wanted to oh, ask oh, about was um, uh, Metal uh, Allegiance. Uh, are you guys still active? Sure. Or, or is that um, sort of like special occasion type it, thing? It, it kind of it kind of got set to the sidelines you know covid for sure you know put it to the sidelines a little bit you know that first record happened um megadeth was supposed to be on the um, maiden voyage of the motorboat cruise and then um you know dave pulled off of it um, and uh the promoter called me because I helped get the band on the cruise. So the promoter calls me and goes, what the fuck am I going to do? The boat's two, two months away. And no way I'm going to get a headliner. He goes, what's Slayer doing? I said, they're in the studio. They're, they're not available. And so we just kind of went down the checklist because I, I, I know what's, what's going on, you know? And I was like, yeah, they're, they're not available. And, uh, so uh, I said, say what? I got this thing that I was going to launch at NAM in a couple of months the boat sailed in October, NAMS in January, I said, um, we we're going to call it Metal Allegiance, and it's kind of an all-star thing. But I said, well, let me make a couple of calls real quick, and I'll hit you back. So I called Mark Minky. I said, dude, because we had literally just put this thing together within the like a couple of weeks before this, right? And um, I, said, I said, check this out. I said, make it us off the boat. Me and Chris Broderick are going to be there anyway. Um, I said, Portnoy is going to be there. Skullnick's going to be there with Testament. I said, let's let's get you know, Scotty and all the MPEX guys to be there. I said, let's fucking launch it now. So we did. We made a couple of calls to the agent. We put it all together uh, to help cover some of the expenses, and we launched it. And and I'd say what, man, it not only was it a great experience, but it, it kind of launched these all-star jams on all of these cruises, right? We close up the, the, the cruise. Um, you know, our friend Danny, who then – uh, also worked with Shiprock. You know they carried on. Now they've got the stowaways. I know um, um, uh, the people with Monsters of Rock Cruise. You know they do their kind of. We just did an All Star Jam kind of thing. Uh, even on the Mega Cruise, you know, uh, we were putting something. I was putting. I was. I, I volunteered to put the, the, the jam together on the Mega Cruise, and and it was it was too much like Metal Legions. And I called Frank Bellow. I go. 
I said, what, what do you suggest? He goes, hey, dude, everybody loves to play Kiss. Why don't you make it a Kiss jam? It's a fucking great idea. So, you know, me and Frank <laughs> and Charlie Benante basically put together the Kiss jam on the Mega Cruise. Um, but, um, you know, so back to 2014, you know, we, 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 we basically launched Metal Allegiance on the motorboat cruise. And um, super fun. And then while we were on the boat, we did, we, we made two nights. And right before the second night, Portnoy at, at dinner, he says, well, why don't we all just go to my house in December and write a record? Because we were, Mangy was getting excited. He goes, we need to write a record. We need to write a kick-ass fucking crash record. And so Gordon and I was like, please come to my house. That's how we write Family Dog or, you know, the other stuff will be does. So we camp out at Casa de Portnoy, uh for a week and basically wrote that first record. And um, and that, that got it going. And Nuclear Blast came to the table and gave us a deal. And, and so then we did the second record. And, you know, one of the hardest things with touring that is, of course, you've got so many famous people on that then the promoter goes, well, who's in the band? If this person's in the band, I'll give you this much money. If it's these guys, it's going to be this much money. You know, mm. so it, it became... It became very tricky, and that's why we decided, look, this was good for, like, man show, cruises, you know, kind of these bigger events. It, it's more of a party band, you know. And um, so, you know, you learn these things. You know, you like we talked the first question, you know, about projects. You know, they're all a project until you, until you kind of figure out where they land, you know. And, and so that was kind of how that one played out. So, yeah, it's still active, and um, there's talk of some more stuff coming up here. Now that's post-COVID everyone's out rolling around the world now i wanted to ask you just a couple quick questions real quick um and one of them is yeah. do you have any funny or cool stories during the whole big four tour that you'd like to uh like to talk about or mention you know you know the big four it's again so we played with metallica before right we even did some stuff in 1993 uh, Count found a distinction for us. Metallica had literally played everywhere on the planet. They were over here in Eastern Europe. The name of the tour was Nowhere Else to Roam, right? I mean, they were literally going into, <laughs> I remember, you know, the, the Czech Republic, the Yugoslavia had just sure. recently been broke, broken up, right? So now you've got, obviously, the Czech Republic, uh, Slovenia, Slovakia, you know, these, these brand new countries that had just been split mm -hmm. out of this, right? So, they're playing in these places, right? You know, Hungary, where you can now play in Budapest. And, um, still felt very, you know, Eastern, you know, coming out of communism, some of these places. But, I mean, that's where we're playing. So we, we've done a bunch of stuff with them before. And so, you know, the big four, um, you know, it's interesting because Dave and I, Dave and I were chatting in 2009. And in fact, I even flew out. We had sushi, hung out at the beach, and we were talking about me coming back to the band. And um, and um, and we talked several times through the net through that decade um, about me coming back. You know, um, and and I and I wanted to for sure. And and Dave was excited about it. It was just it was just kind of a matter. I guess the timing to when it finally would would line up. You know, and, and of course it lined up in 2010. Um, you know, Lomenzo was transitioning out, and you know, Sean Drover and Dave's guitar tech, Willie G, called me, you know, to, to get me back in the band. And it was great. I mean, Dave and I got on the phone, and it's, you know, I drove over and called it. It sounded great. It was fine. Um, and um, so, I, you know, we, I knew a couple of things. First of all, Megadeth was going to go out with Slayer and do an American Carnage tour, but Tom Araya had, had to postpone it to do a neck surgery. So suddenly that opened up this opportunity where the Megadeth manager uh, put on sale the 20th anniversary Rust in Peace tour uh, in March of 2010. First time the band had ever done any of these reunion things. And I'm really glad he did that because it was time. You know, these records were coming of age now. And, and that... These, you know, these sort of themed tours like this around the legacy were becoming popular. So I'm glad we did it. And so it opened the door. It was the perfect time to meet them um, that. And then, of course, uh, I had already known about the Big Four uh, from Metallica's agents, a friend of mine. And I'd seen him at Download because I was over there playing bass for Tim Ripper Owens. Uh, Wendy Deal managed managed him and put him, put us out with Heaven and Hell 
um, on a bunch of shows and they're from downloads. So they're, they're aging. I saw that tour. Stuff. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh right. yeah, man. That yeah, was everything. amazing. And, and I was actually, that was the last time I got to hang with Ronnie too was, uh, was uh, we were in, God, it wasn't Berlin, it was somewhere over here in Germany. And we, we did a show and uh, everybody was gone and it was just us hanging in Ronnie's dressing room and, you know, and uh, we we're just all just hanging out bullshit and they're drinking wine and whatever, you know, hanging out. And it was just great. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't talked to Ronnie much since, you know, we did the So Far So Good So What tour. We had some good conversations, you know, but, um, <clears throat> So that was a really awesome moment, and Dave and I were texting, and and um, so I, you know, I even told the agent, I said, yeah, I think there's a pretty good chance I'll probably be back in Mega Lab sometime this next year, and and so I said, I'm looking forward to the big four, you know. So, and then I can tell you this now because it's, you know, it all happened, right? So um, uh, at the time, obviously, this would have been kind of private information, you know, um, secret secret store secret stuff you know but uh um but yeah so it really worked out great and you know you know i think probably the biggest thing i remember the first day in poland the first show we did uh, we're all super thrilled uh scott ian was kind of the liaison between metallica and everybody you know in fact he's the one who told us i remember we're on the bus right down to uh sophia and he goes hey just talk to Kirk or whoever, and he goes, they want us to come up and jam a song with them uh, tomorrow night at the show that we're filming in Bulgaria. Looks like it's going to be Am I Evil? You know, we're going to do the first part. Da, da, da. And so in our dressing room, we always had drums and amps, so we would warm up as a band before we went on stage. So, I mean, I remember every, in Sophia, everybody's in our dressing room, and we're working on the tune, going through it, kind of working it up until they brought us, until they brought us to the whole dressing room. Um, to uh, you know, for, to run through the song before we took it on stage that night. And, um, but yeah, no, those guys were super cool. And, and, and I remember in, in Warsaw, James was backstage, and he was really a champion. Man, he'd, he'd come out, he watched, he watched all of us go to the stage, you know, and he was cheerleading us, you know, like they 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 really made it about all of us. They made it about the event. They made it about the big four. It wasn't like Metallica just stayed over in their complex. And, we were just the opening bands, you know. Metallica went to great lengths to really make it about all of us, you know, and being very inclusive and very available to everybody. And we'd stand on the side of the stage and watch us all play. And super cool, you know. So speaks well, well I to, to ask you. Who they are. Um, well, we're all we're all big Dio and Lemmy and Rush uh, fans, so I just. I always ask everybody, all of uh, anytime we interview anyone, if they have any cool Dio stories. Well, you were just talking about one or Lemmy. Yeah, yeah. Everyone always, everyone always seems to have an amazing Lemmy story for some reason, or a Rush story. If you could regale us with any cool yeah. Dio Lemmy or you know, Rush you know, I I became good. Of course, I knew Mickey D when because he played in uh, King Diamond when we when we did the tour yeah. of Megadeth King Diamond in the summer of '86. So I, I knew him and he, and and then King and Andrew the Rock and then. Um, and, uh, Timmy Hansen and, and Michael Benner and stuff. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I've, I've probably remained best friends with, with Phil, uh, Campbell over the years. Mm. And, um, you know, he, he always liked that my music business book that I wrote that making music your business, uh, book, he, he always admired that. And so I, you know, that's just kind of moved here during himself to me and, and, and on the cruise and stores on the lot. Um, you know, Lemmy, I, I think Dave, Dave was certainly closer to Lemmy, maybe because they were the band leaders and the singers and stuff. You know, um, you know the there there was a moment we when we first got signed the the Peace Sells records it was just coming out and we were gonna do five shows with Motorhead in America. And we did the first one at the uh, I think it's Kaiser Auditorium in Oakland. Um and um, and then we were, did Santa Monica Civic, and there's I think three more we were going to do. But Pete Gill, the drummer of the band at the time, had these train tracks that would go out to Lemmy's mic stand for his drum solo, right? Because this is the Orgasmatron tour, right? So yeah. mm, kind of the train sure. things. You have these drums, so, but it really made it difficult for us to set our drums up on the stage in the center of the stage. It was really it was really fucked up. It was not very 
and it wasn't set up well for a support act at all. Um, so our managers get into a beef and, and they pull us off to do tour, right? So we only do two of the five shows. So mm. there, there were hard feelings between Megadeth and, and Motorhead. I, I know they were not very happy about that because um, they were excited to have us there. Now, of course, they had to go get another band and we were advertised, sure. blah, blah, blah. So, it, you know, that, that caused some just, you know, just hard feelings between, between the groups. And, you know, many years later, 2001, we were playing at Grass Pop. And, in fact, I just saw the poster a couple of weeks ago when we were there. Um, that um, I forgot who the headliner was. There's was somebody, um, and then it was going to be Megadeth and then Motorhead, etc. Right? And the promoter comes to us right before we go on stage. He says, or "No, no." The promoter comes to us in the afternoon. And says, "Listen, Motorhead's about broke down. They're about two hours away. There's, there's no way they're going to get here in time for their set, and I can't pay them if they don't go on." And obviously, everybody needs to get paid, right? He said, would you guys be so kind to change places with Motorhead? Now, I know you're on a higher billing, but if you could take their spot and play before them and let them play after you, it'll make it all work. They'll be able to be here. The fans will be happy. I can pay them. So, and, and, we, and I remember we said, we said, yeah, of course. It's Lenny, it's Motorhead. For them, for sure. You know? um, so we did. And um, as we were coming off stage... Going back to our dressing room, they had literally just pulled up and they were, their air conditioning wasn't working. I mean, it was fucked up. It was a hot day, you know, they were, and they, but they were very appreciative and big hugs and smiles and thank you so much. Thanks for helping us out. And so that, that melted the ice, you know, the 20 years nice. before or whatever, you know, kind of, uh, you know, hard feelings. And then everything was great after that. Everything was fine. So, um, um, so that's the happy ending of the motorhead story. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, um, do you have any final words out there for your your fans, especially the ones that are in Australia coming up here? Yeah, well, look, I'm super stoked to be going to Australia. Thanks for having us. Uh, we will not disappoint. We'll rock your rock your world, and like I said, we're going to play these songs that you probably haven't heard before and may never hear again. So this is this is an event not to be missed. So uh, super looking forward to getting back down to Australia. Super great talking to you guys, man. Thanks for setting cool, this up. That's, across I, three I three major time zones. We divided the world in thirds today to make this happen. All right, well, cool. I, I have one final thing to say, and that is remember, look to the stars, carry that torch of enlightenment, and strive to be a disciple of rock and roll in the Brotherhood of Orpheus. All right, we got a couple left. So it's methadone.
was sick. 